How can I record a new curb log all about the industry tonight? How it began in Dallas, Fort Worth, I'll guess I'll give it a shot. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Voice October 2016, where I'm interviewing various voice acting veterans from the U.S. and Canada to learn about the history of how they started and where they started. Today, we're talking about Texas uh, and I'm joined by a lovely, uh, another new uh, first-time guest, uh, quite an excellent one, who uh, you would know as for the last, I think, God, almost 20 years, maybe around that time, uh, as the voice of Master Roshi uh, in the Dragon Ball franchise, as well as tons of other characters. Uh, uh, Pui Pui, my, everybody's favorite, mine, mine certainly. <laughs> uh, as, well, as well as uh, Buggy the Clown and other various characters on One Piece. Uh, most recently, Charlie slash Nash on uh, Street Fighter V, which just came out a little while ago. And is also a uh, writer, producer, director, like multi-threat for tons of shows down at Funimation, uh, not the least of which are the likes of Fullmetal Alchemist, One Piece, uh, Mushishi, Eden of the East, the list goes on and on. Uh, I'm joined by the lovely and talented Mike McFarland. Hi, thanks for coming on. Hey man, thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, so I will, uh, I'll, I'll cut right into it. So, all right, it's the mid-90s. Funimation hasn't quite set up shop in terms of its voice recording there yet. At this time, they're still doing everything out of Canada. Um, so by this time, uh, where, where, are, where are you on the, on the night of the 5th, in the, in the mid to late 90s before your, uh, your career in anime has, has you know, manifested itself? Mid to late 90s um, was in college, um, I was getting my degree in music business, uh, so it's like a BFA in music with a concentration in business and a minor in theater. So I was getting some of my theatrical studies there um, and had been in several plays, a couple of short films, um, taking uh, all, all of the classes required for such a degree. Uh, and I believe I already had like agent number two by then oh, wow. and was doing, doing commercial work and industrial work and whatever else the, that could be lined up. So then uh, the legendary open cattle call uh, opens up, finds you, uh, Chris Abbott, Brad Jackson, Lori Steele, uh, since the beginning, since like that, the first, uh, I think it was Sleeping Princess and Devil's Castle Dragon Ball movie. Um, yeah, that was the first thing we did, yeah. And, and from what I understand, that was basically like a, a test of like, all right, so we've been doing this in Canada for all this time. Let's see if we can do this here to begin with. This is kind of uh, what, I, what I gathered about that movie at the time. Um, so when this yeah. started... That was my understanding of what, uh, what that was, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, so was this, was this like basically the creation of like character slash animation you know whatever you want to just define it as like the voiceover industry as far as dallas goes for that sort of stuff like what were the really early days of funimation like for all of you guys um well if there were other things going on um i wasn't completely aware of them as far as adr or anime or anything like that in the dallas fort worth area mm -hmm. um uh, the stuff that I had done character wise were, you know, like voiceovers for commercials and things of that nature. So it wasn't completely, completely new, but doing it in an ADR style with an ongoing character was new. Right. Um, uh, we, I mean, cause like, obviously, uh, the, the artist formerly known as ADV was, you know, doing tons and tons of stuff, uh, you know, long before that, uh, in Houston. Uh, yeah, the around a couple of years i don't think it was like long 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 before that but you know maybe oh, okay well, i might see that, that's the sad thing is because so many of those shows were from like you know the 80s or or like early 90s even and then like a lot of these companies weren't doing them until way later my timetable of like when certain dubs were recorded was was off like even even on like imdb it's like dragon ball z it recorded in like you know 1989 i'm like they weren't even doing that yet so <laughs> it's hard to keep track of all that um yeah yeah I think that was the case. I think they, you know, got started um, maybe a couple of years before us, uh, and ha had been, as you as you made note of, doing some stuff from the '80s and early '90s. So it's kind of hard to get a true grasp on exactly when things started. So, so when you were first going in, and you know, just 
basically just doing character stuff for you know all of Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z, which was the, the first and only thing that they really had at the time. Uh, what what was the? I mean, I, I know like the building has changed many times and et cetera, but like what what was that time kind of like for like everybody for all the really early folks like when you guys started like picked up in the middle of the the Namek you know Frieza stuff or whatever like at the very beginning of that. Um, well, I mean, as far as learning how to do ADR, there was a learning curve because it was, you know, you were hired to do that and you learned how to do it while doing it. There wasn't any sort of ADR training class that you could take or anything like that. But luckily, you know, those, those folks that you had mentioned before, like Lori and Brad and all those guys, um, you know, have some sort of acting background or had done radio or had done something where you know, having to maintain some sort of persona and or using your voice to do such a thing had come in, you know, before with training. So then it was just a matter of learning this new process of how to do it to make it work for ADR purposes. And I imagine that I, it must have been a nightmare when it was still the VHS uh, technology being used for, for doing that, which, you know, now I know is, is, is such a thankful thing of the past. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, luckily we weren't, we weren't recording to VHS. <laughs> so, oh, okay, yeah. Because um, at least the, they were still pressing to VHS at the time. Right. Uh, they, yeah, you actually, know. because I, I remember, like, the, the actually the Dragon Ball Z DVDs were some of the first DVDs I ever had that I can't can even, like, remember uh, coming out because it's it still seems so new. And I was, I was still collecting uh, a lot of the stuff that you guys had been doing at that time on VHS, <laughs> so... Time frame, yeah. speaking of which. Yeah, I think um, somewhere else I still have some VHS stuff here and there. I'm not sure if I have any Funimation stuff, but I definitely have a couple of VHS things that have not seen a player in, oh, a long time. Well, well, <laughs> over, well, well over a decade, probably closer to two. So, uh, so within those first two years, and then when, um, when Funny started getting uh, a few more shows... Uh, the, the days of uh, Blue Gender, uh, Fruits Baskets, uh, Yu Yu Hakusho, which I still adore to this day, um, all of which. So uh, then you started directing stuff. And I remember seeing your name uh, popping around on some Yu Yu Hakusho stuff and, uh, and then a lot of, a lot of Dragon Ball. Uh, how, did, uh, how did you kind of get, because I mean now, I mean like you're like one of the major known directors at the company, have been for a long time. How did you uh, kind of get into that? Like, was it right place at the right time kind of thing? Like, what was, what was kind of the shift there? Well, I think uh, from my recollection of what was going on, um, Barry Watson had transitioned into mostly just doing producing by that point. Mm -hmm. And the directors were Christopher Sabat and Justin Cook had just started directing as well. Um, but what they wanted was there was there were a few actors that had very limited availability for like evenings or weekends, and then they did not have uh, on top of that they did not have a backup plan for if Christopher or Justin got sick or were at a con or wanted a vacation or wanted time off or anything like that. So I was approached to come in and uh, be a substitute director you know, uh, shadow them for a brief amount of time. And um, then when the, when the, you know, when the time came to just uh, take over directing duties uh, for the evenings or when times when those guys were out. And I think a combination of their, you know, experience of working with me in the booth and the knowledge that I had worked on a lot of, uh, you know, short and or independent film stuff. I'd done a lot of theater. Uh, I'd taken directing courses in college. Um, you know, they, they thought all that together made a, you know, a nice match for let's ask this person to do this job. The first ever session that I was directing, uh, like Solo Flight, uh, was I directed Duncan Brannon as Bobbity in Dragon Ball Z, and uh, it was also Christopher Bevan's first day doing anything. He was there as my nighttime substitute engineer guy. And uh, and then later, which led to, uh, you know, you and Bevins have tag teamed on uh, Dragon Ball and and then One Piece in the, in the beginning of when you guys were doing that. 
and uh, and I, I mean, both of you guys have directed like, you know, the, the huge amount of shows uh, since then. Was that was that still was that like early two thousands? I guess would that have been about? Yeah, um, I, I probably like straight up two thousand. I think is when wow. I started. <laughs> maybe oh God. Maybe and if not then 2000 mm -hmm. because uh, I do as far as timeline goes because everyone who was you know uh, alive and old enough to have memories by that point and right. you know for those memories uh, I remember being up at the studio on, uh, on 9-11 uh, so by then I was already directing and had been doing so for a little while so right I would have to say 99 or 2000 was my starting point. And, and now, uh, cause I mean, like I was saying, like you, you seem to be like one of the go-to, I mean, you, you know, you've gotten to do like, a, you know, these, these big movies like summer wars and, uh, you know, like a lot of these, these major shows and everything. Um, what, what was this journey into like, I know it's, it's maybe it's difficult to, to answer in, in, in such a short span, but like the journey of getting to that point where like, you know, people like you and Colleen uh, are, are in those kind of positions. Like, you know, what, what, are, what are some experiences you had over the course of all these different shows, all these, you know, these 20, close to 20 years now of, of directing people, like, you know, that kind of led you to this point, do you think? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I know that as far as the first show that I was asked to, you know, when it, when it became – more than just substitution, uh, substitution or substituting or, you know, coming in and on nights and weekends, whatever, when they wanted me to be up there on a daily, more regular basis mm -hmm. was Dragon Ball. Uh, I think Justin Cook was transitioning to either start Yu Yu Hakusho or Fruits Basket or something, and they wanted me to do the second half of the original Dragon Ball series and then still help out with Z as needed. Mm. Um, but let's see. Not long after that was starting up Case Closed, I believe. And then somewhere um, in the midst of doing that uh, was Full Metal Alchemist, the, the first go-round of Full Metal Alchemist. Mm -hmm. So somewhere in between, you know, getting my feet wet of learning how to direct... Uh, for ADR with these other couple of shows and getting some time frame to do that, you know, three, four years later, um, something that, um, you know, is, is different tonally than other things that I'd worked on before, mm -hmm. uh, handed to myself and Colleen to kind of head that up. Um, and during those years there, we worked on Fruits Basket, which as far as Funimation is concerned, and, and my opinion of the work that Funny was doing, that was the first like full-on anime anime that we had had. Right. <laughs> uh, obviously, like Dragon Ball and Yu Yu Hakusho are anime, but it, you know those are uh, tournament fighting shows and et cetera, et cetera. And, and beyond Blue Gender, that's all we'd really had up to that point. And Blue Gender is still like action-adventure shoot 'em up kind of thing. Yeah. Fruits Basket was the first thing that we had that was absolutely nothing like any of those things. Yeah. Uh, and so listening to some of that and uh, watching at, at, through those years, I befriended uh, other actors from other companies and was watching the different ty uh, types of anime that they were working on that wasn't what Funimation was doing at all. Um, that kind of helped to give me um, some sort of, you know, some sort of direction and spearheading of how Full Metal Alchemist should be handled. Right. And because well, I, I still remember and, and I mean it's crazy to think that that was over ten years ago already when that the, when the first series started. Uh, yeah, I, I think still, it was I still vividly remember that like literally taking over the world, like how, how big that show was in in the US by itself. Yeah, it, it was you know, it was very well received um, in luckily in in uh, Japanese and in English. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's just a, you know, it's a really well done show. And I know Colleen and I both worked really hard on trying to, you know, have the storytelling, uh, you know, er for everything to maintain its integrity, for all of the actors to bring their A game on everything, to not, you know, even with the bit parts here and there, to not just, you know, who happens to be working in some other room at the time, you, I need you, you know, come here, like, you know, the cast thing and, and just 
make sure that uh, it's the best that it could be. Well, and also, because uh, I think between you and Justin in particular, uh, and, and Sabbath too, uh, although I know Sabbath was kind of probably more stuck to, like, you know, the way DBZ was at that time before the advent of Kai came around, um, it seemed like there was kind of a, a, this revolution happening within the company of, like, you know, of doing these, because I, what, I, what I also remember was, you know, in those times of, like, when Funny used to get ragged on by people because of their, quote-unquote, treatment of DBZ at the time, um, but then by the time that uh, a lot of these other shows were coming in, you know, it, that, that was the beginning, uh, well, that's the beginning of what led to now where Funimation is heralded by people for, you know, one of the companies that makes the best dubs out there. Uh, and and mm -hmm. FMA and the amount of, of work that went into that from you and Colleen and, and, and Justin producing and, uh, mm -hmm. and the Joel, the writer, uh, Joel, Joel wrote that show, I think, right? Uh, yeah, he was. Uh, I think I adapted some of it, but Joel was, you know, he did most of it. Right, right. Um, Ollie yeah. may have done it well, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's right, yeah, because you guys were doing, like, everything. Like, literally, that was, like, because <laughs> it was, it, it was, it was uh, the first one was 52 episodes, I think, right? 52, yeah. Um, and, you know, we weren't necessarily doing everything. You know, there was a writing crew and whatever else, but mm -hmm. um, it was at, you know, that point in time when some of us who were directors were, you know, looking for other things to do uh, as well. What else could we do in the, within the, the company to help keep things going? And uh, writing was one of them. Well, you were, you were also talking about this before when you were starting to meet other, uh, other folks from different companies. And FMA's dub, uh, both it and, and Brotherhood, I would say, but um, the, w the first one at the time, like, there, was, there was really nothing else like it in terms of like, the kind of all-star you know, alignment of all these different folks from different places, like you know, tossed in as different characters and things. Um, yeah. What's uh, when you, when you were talking about meeting other folks like from Houston and, and like Scott who was up in Canada and there's some folks from LA and New York, etc. What was what was it like, kind of bridging the connection like together, all these different guys, and like how did you make a lot of these connections, inducting them, and, and now you know so many of them who have been inducted like into the funny pool as it is, like especially the the Houston guys in particular. Um, I'm not sure what necessarily started all that. I think the first one that I remember of not being a local um, that was doing stuff for funny, I think Vic approached Justin Cook mm -hmm. um, either via email or maybe at a con or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, Justin had him up for something. It may have been Yu Yu Hakusho. I can't remember all the ins and outs of who all was in Yu Yu Hakusho. Right. But, um, you know, uh, that led me to uh, kind of have the, oh, wow, we can, you, that's okay. You guys are all right, all right with that. And I think it came down to, you know, as long as everything gets done in the same amount of time and we don't have to make a lot of exceptions for out of town folks mm -hmm. as far as the timeline goes, then they're fine with it. And so a lot of the folks that I had met and uh, who, whose work that I admired, I mentioned that, you know, when I would meet new people and I liked them or, you know, got along with them really well, I'd want to see some of their work. So I'd watch things and go like, oh, wow, you know, I see where your voice fits in and I see what this does and you're really strong in this area and whatever else. These are neat qualities. And having um, watched all of those and met people over the years of going to uh, events and conventions and stuff, led me to, you know, when we were doing Full Metal and the cast is so very, very big um, of bringing in people from out of town, not just for, like, novelty purposes at all, but, like, to make it just that much more special of a show. Yeah. You know, to, rather than limit yourself to the best locally that could handle each of these parts, why don't we, like, do, like, the best nationally uh, or internationally? You know, we have Scott in the show, too, mm -hmm. uh, th that, you know, or can adhere to all of those things. Like we can, we can get them down in the studio. We can still hit the timelines. They'd like to do it. We'd like to have them, you know, all of the um, stars aligned to make it happen. And then we, you know, went from there. And, and it's crazy. Cause like, you know, again, from what I remember too, it's like, you know, you, you look at when FMA started and it's like, Oh, you know, Monica and, and Lucy Christian and all these folks. And now it's, and, and now they're like, you know, mainstays, they're, they're all these major characters and in, in a lot of shows at funny all the yeah. time. And, and it's funny cause like I, well, li literally funny, haha, with, with, um, with all these folks, I'm like, my God. And so many of these guys 
are cool with like driving, you know, how, however, what, four or five hours, however long it takes to get between Houston and Dallas. It's like yeah. the dedication Depends that comes with that is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so, you know, uh, if, if you are, you know, if you're an L.A. actor and you live in one part of L.A. and you have a session in a certain time frame during the day or whatever, it's not like it's not going to take that person two or three hours to get there either. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, dep- luckily, depending on the day, luckily, yeah. <laughs> luckily for, luckily for uh, Texans, most of the time it's just a straight shot of highway, but with more or less the same number of hours to get there. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I, I imagine podcasts probably come in handy on this. Um, yeah. So, uh, so I, I also sp- speaking of inducting in new folks, uh, you brought in a lot of new folks uh, between veterans and a lot of up and comers as well to the fold uh, of VO as far as anime goes. Uh, mm-hmm. So, when you're working with somebody new for the first time, because um, I know that a, a lot of the different folks, uh, you know, at, at Funny have like kind of different uh, styles and different kind of preferences and how they go about things. Um, what's what's kind of your process of like breaking somebody in if like they're totally new or if like you know, if, if they're experienced, but like they're not maybe used to like the same kind of way of doing things at Funny. And I don't know how, how different things are comparatively now, uh, maybe more so back in the day. Like what, what's what's kind of your process for, for getting them initiated, I guess? Um, I'm not sure if there's necessarily a process. Uh, if it's people who've done ADR work, but just not at Funimation, I'll go over the script and explain like this is what this means and this is what that means. And these are how our scripts are formatted, so they can make the mental adjustment of, oh, you know, I'm used to seeing this slash marker, this whatever, and they do it with ellipses. Like, you know, just explain the differences. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if, um, you know, a lot of the Houston folks are used to doing the old chase method um, without having a, a beep lead-in system, and I explain how, you know, that works and what's going on and why we do it that way, et cetera, et cetera. Um, otherwise, most of the rest of the country uses the same you know, beep lead-in system that we use. Um, if it's trained actors that haven't done ADR work before, I'll probably spend, you know, I might book them for extra time and spend in a good amount of time explaining what everything does and why we do it the way we do and how the previews work and what you're listening for and, you know, all of that sort of thing. And then we start tracking and, uh, you know, explain how my direction works and what my my shorthand of direction means because I'm trying to allow them time to make just quick adjustments and get what I need rather than go into like, you know, 40 seconds worth of explanation to get like a a breath differently or something. (laughs) Um, And if they, uh, you know, if they haven't acted at all and they just have some sort of interesting voice or whatever, I honestly, I generally, I don't do a lot of hiring of those folks. I want them to, I want them to take care of their own uh, learning how to emote and act and, you know, be a character and, and tell the truth um, w- before they even start trying to get work that is uh, acting work. So, mm-hmm. um, it, that doesn't prevent, you know, folks from um, being signed on by other directors or whatever else, and I come into contact with them, like, oh, okay, there's, you know, this person shows a lot of promise, et cetera, et cetera, but... I tend to hire people that uh, have a, you know, a established acting background of some sort, mm-hmm. either scholastic or on stage or whatever. Uh, well, especially with the the advent of uh, all these broadcast dubs uh, and the yeah. you know, um, Pokemon esque time frame of like one episode a week, ready go. <laughs> Um, yeah. there, there's been more and more and more, uh, just even in the last year alone, a lot of new folks, uh, that have been given a shot and, uh-huh. uh, and there, and there's more that, that seem like they come in every day. Like I, despite my being, being a, a walking, talking encyclopedia, I'm just like, Oh, I don't recognize that person. Oh, wow. Wow. There are really a lot of people that I've never heard of in this before, which is exciting because it's cool to see so much variation. Um, yeah. to any folks, uh, that might be listening to this later that, uh, and including maybe even if they're in uh, the Dallas area and uh, if perhaps they, they get a shot, uh, do you have any kind of advice, any, any kind of things that maybe pitfalls not to fall into from, you know, your experience of, of trying out some new folks and qualities you've seen in newer folks that, like, really stick out to you that, that you, you think show that they know what they're doing? Um, 
sort of auditiony type tips or making good first impression tips? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, um, I would suggest things like, you know, of course, being early, not just on time, but being early. Um, there's usually a lot of things to look over before you even go in. So if you just show up on time and they're immediately ready for you, then you haven't looked over anything. Uh, so you're not familiar with what you're actually going to audition for. Uh, and what the materials are. So make sure you plan enough time to, you know, study and make use of that time before you are called in. When you are called in, um, be nice, be courteous, be professional. Um, but it really does not pay off to uh, to fanboy in any capacity. <laughs> Have any sort of like, oh my God, I'm in this building, or uh, oh, it's so you know so neat. I uh, I've watched your work for a long time. Whatever else. Keep those things in check. Keep those in your head and don't say them out loud. Um, just come in and, you know, uh, treat it like it's just any order of, uh, sort of professional job or thing, just like you're interviewing for a job at, you know, someplace that's not involved with acting. <laughs> I mean, not, not that it's not good to be excited and appreciative, but, yeah, definitely it's, it's, a, yeah, it's still a job. <laughs> yeah, just keep it in check. I realize that, you know, there's all sorts of, neat and wondrous things and oh you know oh goodness i'm here um and i and i do that too depending on where i go but you know i also have to keep myself in check i can't um i can't freak out and fanboy out when i have a job to do or when i'm trying to make a professional first impression actually on on that note uh i'm i'm curious so uh you were talking about joking about la <laughs> traffic before um you have actually got to do a, a pretty cool amount of stuff out here, uh, particularly in video yeah. games. Um, yeah, I think I've done more there uh, in L.A. than I've done in Houston. Um, oh, wow. So <laughs> yeah. over over the past, I don't know, decade or so, I've gone back and forth to L.A. many, many times, uh, and I'm very, very, you know, pleased uh, and very uh, um, humbled to have be asked to do that when they have, you know, obviously if there's a, an actor hub in the United States, that's it. And they have a lot of actors out there already. So for me to be called in from elsewhere to come in and work on something is a huge honor, and I appreciate it. So, uh, Especially, it's, it seems like it's becoming, and then actually, you know, linking back to you again, too, because I remember when, uh, when uh, One Piece was, was kicking up and I was hearing um, Patrick mixed in there as Frankie at the very beginning, and I was like, yeah. oh my god, wow. And, and I was surprised by that, because I, I figured the intention was that when, and as it was, when you guys got up to that, he was going to be coming in to do it. Uh, and I, and it, it's, it seemed that was uh, the beginning of uh, this deal now, where there's a lot of folks that jump between, uh, I mean, like, there's people who go between, like, Vancouver and L.A., from New York to Texas to L.A. to, you know, all three to all however many uh, and now, you know, with especially with with like Street Fighter and um, and like uh, Street Fighter Tekken before that and stuff like that, uh, you've been getting to do that a lot more. Um, what what is like literally? What is that like? Like, do you find yourself on a plane? Like, you know, or or do like do guys like you and Patrick and Mercer like find your, yourself on a plane like once every few months or, or whatever? Well, I mean, it just depends. Uh, like for. Um... For Patrick, you know, Patrick is in a lot of shows out here at Funny, mm -hmm. and um, we love working with him. He's such a great guy and a great talent, great actor. Um, but he also has to let us know the heads up of, you know, I have these things going on, and I have this, and I have this, and I have this window of time that I can work with you. Mm -hmm. And we try to make all of those things line up. Um, uh, as far as going back and forth, whatever else, uh, you know, Mercer's another case. Mercer's in several things in um, uh, for Funimation, and it really just depends on how the show's being recorded, what's going on, what's his time frame. He gets busier and busier every week of his life. Yeah, <laughs> he's more and more booked all the time, doing all sorts of things, and we you know we're we're stoked for him and we're happy for him. Um, but you know, we we try to be real honest and real upfront about like you know we have this time frame and this level of expectation, and we'll bend over backwards in, in whatever capacity that we can. But you know, we have these two or three things that can't be moved. So what can we do? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the same way with me when I get to go to uh, L.A. or you know Houston every so often, or I've you know I've recorded a couple of things in New York too. It just depends on what their time frame is and what they you know, what we can do about that, because 
I, I love working with other places. I love, you know, working with different people and uh, getting different opportunities. It's, it's great. Um, but I also don't want to be a burden on anything that they're doing and create a problem just because I'm not local. Right. Um, yeah. No, it's really cool. And, and I, you know, I, I like to not see it necessarily as a novelty. I, I think it's, it's really, really cool and interesting and, and lends itself well to a final product when you have like a really interesting variation of, you know, different folks from different places and for different reasons with different experiences that all kind of come to the table in one thing. Um, you know, mm -hmm. not, not, not every project always necessarily has the time, uh, you know, and the resources to do that. Uh, but when it happens, it's really, I mean, I mean, Street Fighter having people from like all over the place like that in and of itself, I think is really cool. Um, yeah, that's cool. And, and video game timeframes, especially something like that, you know, you like, I don't remember the exact time frame of what window that was open, but I, you know, I think that that was a, you know, multi-month process you know a couple of months maybe three months at least two months i don't think they finished that entire thing in, in less than four weeks right um so there is a little bit of wiggle room here and there as far as you know it has to be between this time and this time and something like that makes it a lot easier than say the current broadcast dub schedule with uh, with something like that where it has to be between monday and maybe next tuesday and that's your entire window of time or else you're out uh, yeah <laughs> Um, another, well, as also, as far as, uh, you know, the time frame of never ending <laughs> or at least not for probably a very long time, uh, one piece, which is still to this day. And, and, and it's crazy to think that it's, it's, we're coming up on almost 10 years of you guys doing that now too, I think. Um, yeah. Um, 2017 will be 10 years. Whew, Jesus. And no, another mm -hmm. case, I remember the, actually my first time visiting California, uh, Anime Expo 2007, when you and Justin were up there and announced the Straw Hats, and it was a, it was a huge event, and there was celebratings, and it was like the liberation of France in the streets for the anime community, uh, yeah. and, it, and it was really cool. And um, and, and yeah, I've, you know, I've been following that for all this time. And it, what, what's cr incredible about that show um, is is it, it's like this giant amalgamation of everything, where it's like it's all the veterans in like you know in the main cast. You have all these really cool cameos and special guest folks that that, that pop in for different characters, um, mm -hmm. you know. And then like, uh, uh, and and then even even as of late, like lo again, a lot of new people. I, I even remember when um, uh, when this, even season five was like a while ago. Now season four, even with uh, Water Seven, I was like, wow, like all these like Alex Organ and 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 uh, 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 Camacho. I forget his first name. Um, yep. Macho, yeah, and and I'm like, I say, like, oh, all these cool new people, and they all sound great, and like, there's there's all this like interesting kind of choices for all these new characters, and it's exciting. It's like I I get excited watching the show all over again because I follow it in Japanese too as, as it comes right. out, but it's like exciting to see it again. Like I'm like I'm experiencing something like new for the first time, except not, except a little different, like, <laughs> like the JJ Abrams, Abrams treatment. Um, mm. That I, and also I know that, that that show is 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 very special to you. Um, any any particular uh, like I mean I know there's probably a billion, but like moments or stories or or funny things and interesting things about uh, all the time on that show, like like since it started to all the way up until now. Um, I can't think of anything in you know particular uh, you know that just monumentally stands out. Um, I love working with all of the Straw Hats. They're such great people, and they're they're good friends of mine, and um, you know they they've become good friends of mine because of the amount of time that we work together and the things that we've you know uh, the time we've spent. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't just sit around and hire all my buddies for a show, <laughs> but you know you know what I mean. Um, but uh, I think the most you know fun that I had working on One Piece, uh, along with just uh, the beginning of it and the excitement of casting it and getting things going and uh, the earliest recordings. Uh, what was most fun for me was getting to come in after uh, after just having only enough time to produce it and kind of looking over it to going back to directing again and doing uh, that whole uh, the Foxy Games and Water 7 and Innie's Lobby and doing about 100 plus episodes in a row of uh, just being just me directing. Mm -hmm. Um, I loved, loved, loved that whole section, and I'm so glad that if, if there was a section where I got to do 100-plus episodes of the show in a row myself, 
that it was that section because I love that section. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's still one of my absolute favorite because that that was that was uh, that was coming out in Japan. I think right as I got into the show as a whole, and mm -hmm. uh, and I remember even back when I was reading the manga, I was like I, I was really excited to see that get dubbed and and it was it was splendid um and and then after that uh with thriller bark then uh a lot of stuff has been handed off to joel uh who's also been doing a great job and especially because uh, the, the war is uh finishing up on dvd right now which which i can only imagine was a massive constant headache of how many people had to be in that and in one given episode um, yeah but uh, so so also uh, this is this is something interesting because I don't think this this happens incredibly often with with shows. But when you're uh, like like splitting up duties with other directors and um, and having to like co-producer or, or or you know just oversee and, sh and share everything with another director or producer or or even other writers, etc. Um, what's the I mean like even like back when you were doing FMA with Colleen or like the second one with Caitlin, like what what is uh, what what is the actual process of that like? Because I've I've never split duties with another person in that kind of way creatively before. Uh, it just depends on um, the show. It depends on who you're splitting it with. Like, there's not like a one particular way to do it. Um, in the case of like the little bit of uh, brotherhood that Caitlin worked with along with me, you know, she's a major character in the show, and she's also someone that I've produced her shows. Um, over the years, many times I've produced the dub for Oran and um, other things that uh, she's been the, the director on. So she knows how I work and she knows what my expectations are. And she also, you know, has high expectations of her own work and of herself. So all she really needed to do was, you know, we probably had a quick sit down of like, I want this and this and these things will be the same and these things might be slightly different. And we have these few different people and this is what I hope out of them, uh, hope for out of them, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't like a, a big having to double check back and forth or anything like that. Um, with uh, the first FMA, uh, we uh, Colleen and I talked back and forth a lot about the casting and what would happen from episode to episode. And, you know, if we were bringing in someone from out of town and she had a batch of episodes and I had a batch of episodes of how we would align things to get the actor to do everything that they need to do for both of us rather than have them come back multiple times to take care of business in that capacity. Um, so those things had to get worked out. And as far as uh, One Piece, uh, several people have worked on it uh, as voice directors. Um, probably one of the widest range of uh, voice directors of any current show that's up at Funny. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Dragon Ball and Yu Yu Hakusho and some other ones like that had uh, several directors on them along the way, but everyone mostly associates the Dragon Ball stuff with Sabbath mm -hmm. uh, because he's done the most of it. So, I, and I, I think even, even uh, at this point, uh, when I've only worked on, you know, 30, 40 episodes over the past hundred, couple of hundred episodes, <laughs> um, that most people still associate me with uh, the One Piece franchise because I've been overseeing it in some capacity for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, but how that works with Joel is, you know, I, I watch over the things that he works on, that he directs, and I try to make sure that we're still making the same show. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm by no means in charge of him, you know. I'm, I'm not his boss at all. He's, he's in charge of his own stuff, and he reports to people above, you know, above both of us. Um, but I try to uh, offer up my services as, you know, having worked on so much of the dub to try to keep the canon going and try to keep everyone in character, you know, along the way we may have new script writers enter the picture and they might have Chopper or Zorro or someone say something that not exactly the way that they would word it or not exactly the way that, you know, it might fit with the translation, but as far as what we've had them say before, you could, um, adapt it this way or you could adapt it this other way and maybe this other way would be more in line with what we have you know like it's not necessarily wrong one way or the other but this way might be a better fit does that make sense yeah yeah absolutely well now, especially because like you know with a show like that where like there is so much that you have to be aware of with like terms and and characters and like the statuses of things and it, and it could be easy to like oh right i forgot he has like a sickness of 
this thing or whatever, and that was mentioned like 500 episodes ago. It's like, you know, I think it's important yeah. to, to make sure that everybody's on, like, an, on enough of the same page that, you know, nothing right. gets lost. <laughs> Even as something as simple as, you know, if we come across some new form of giant sea creature, is that a sea king or is it something else? And if it, you know, if it's not a sea king, then what's it called? And if it's vague, can we find out if this is supposed to be a sea king or not? Like just things like that that would pop up frequently through um, either ones that I was directing or ones that I was overseeing with people like oh, Scott Sager or Caitlin or you know the other handful of uh, folks that were working on the show from time to time uh, that I would have to make sure that all lined up with what we were already doing. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I offer up my services in that capacity and say, you know, I, I suggest maybe these changes here and there, or um, this one, uh, the, the pronunciation, that's not what we've been saying. No one has said it in 200 episodes, but it's actually pronounced like this, and I'll suggest pickups of that capacity. And, but you know, even with, within that, those are all suggestions, and it's up to Joel and uh, the producers above us to decide whether or not they want to adhere to those things, so... Uh, well, perfect segue into my, my last question. Um, so myself included on this, uh, a lot of folks with indie projects and, um, and even at funny with like, with so many shows that there, there have been and, and et cetera, and uh, some other companies, uh, a lot more folks are actually getting into voice directing now. Um, and, uh, and there's been a lot of so surprisingly a lot more opportunities with doing that. Um, although it's a little bit more of a rare case, uh, any any particular advice or anything that that uh, that you can offer up for up and coming voice directors in in the rare cases where that'll happen? Um, well, I mean, hopefully they have a background. If they're going to direct something like this, they have a background in uh, at least now that it's 2016, and we're probably not going to hire completely out of house. Right. That the directors uh, the actors who are up and coming directors or whatever, or whoever is an up and coming director will have served some sort of number of hours in the booth in some capacity. Mm -hmm. They understand what it's like to be in there. They understand, uh, the capacities of, uh, what the engineer can do with pro tools and what can and can't be done. Um, which, which things are important, which things, um, are you listening for? Um, how to direct each individual actor because you don't have direct everyone the same way. Different actors, you know, relate better to different stimuli and different instructions. So you can't just say do it this way or do it that way for everybody that walks in the room because some people aren't going to react uh, the way that you would like or give you the performance that you're asking for because everyone is their own individual person. Um, but... Yeah, definitely having had spent time in the booth itself, uh, I think, is a great advantage. Mm -hmm. Understanding and not both a, sides of the glass, as it were. Yeah, not only an advantage, but pretty much a necessity. So, right. yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, I think that's, uh, that's going to wrap us up. So, uh, first of all, thanks so much for making the time in between. I know you've got probably a billion things going on, but uh, this is awesome. Uh, any... I, I, don't, I don't know if there's uh, too much in NDA zone right now, but any particular things you want to plug, any stuff coming out that you want to talk about that people should keep an eye out for? Well, I could at least mention some things that are recent releases and um, maybe an ongoing thing or two. Um, recent releases, uh, The Empire of Corpses is a movie that I worked on, and I really, really enjoy it. Um, Boy and the Beast, uh, the latest uh, whole set of film. Uh, it's been out... Uh, a few weeks, maybe a month or two. It, uh, that's something that I really enjoyed working on. Um, um, let's see. I'm currently working on the broadcast dub for Honda-kun, which is the prequel to Barakamon. And it's a, a, a b bizarre prequel, but if you liked Barakamon, uh, then it's funny to see where Honda's origins of his quirky personality came from. Um, I'm acting in, let's see, um, Arslan. I'm the narrator for uh, The Legend of Arslan. Uh, and I'm uh, Belkia in Sir Vamp. And I think that's the bulk of what I have or what I'm working on that I can talk about. 
B- Buggy's been uh, pretty prominent in the last few uh, One Piece DVDs, yeah, it's, certainly. It's, it's been a nice resurgence of Buggy. I actually think the, you know, uh, impelled down section of Buggy, I think that's way more Buggy than I've ever done, you know, if they pile up all the buggy that's been on the show leading up to that point. I think Impel Down still takes the cake with how much, <laughs> much e- green. Even, even his original arc that he started. <laughs> definitely, definitely more than his original arc. Actually, I, I realize it's kind of quite fitting, isn't it? That Because you were talking before, uh, Duncan Brennan was the first person you uh, directed. And now mm-hmm. Mr. Three is more or less Buggy's, like, you know, partner in crime, as it were. <laughs> And Duncan yeah, they are. Him, so. so I love it. Uh, awesome. Well, Mike, thank you again. This was really cool. Uh, and uh, I guess that's going to wrap us up. So, everybody, in the comments below, uh, if you have any particular favorite uh, moments from any uh, Dallas dubbed anime series, uh, particular any particularly any ones that were that were done by Mike uh, from his long list of stuff, uh, any anything that you have any thoughts on, you want to share, that would be cool. Uh, leave a comment about that. Uh, as always, I don't know who the next guest will be because I don't know what order these are going to come out just yet. But um, but yeah, and I'll have I'll have some links to all of Mike's social media stuff and other things you can check out on Funimation, etc. That's it for us. That's it for me. That's it for Mike. And we will see you on the next one. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for having me.